and joined by the co-CEO of Kalal Group, uh, Q Song Lee. Q, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be with you. Well, I'm delighted to be here and thank you for having me. Uh, we want to start on, on some of the, the macro sentiment. A lot of the sure. bank CEOs at this conference have been striking an overall upbeat tone, but particularly upbeat on the U.S. consumers. As you assess the U.S. economy, do you think it's just the consumer that's strong? Well, you know, the, the consumer sector is certainly strong and it's offsetting some of the weakness we're seeing in industrial. But globally, when you take a step back, we are in a period of time, I think, where we're seeing slower growth globally. Um, it's not negative. So we still have positive growth, but it's the whole world we're seeing it as slowing down. And I think the number one question I keep getting is, do you see a recession in 2020? And right now, our data would say probably not. But I think the real question to ask is, Longer term, uh, only probably not. Right, probably so it's still not. Possible. Yeah, I, my confidence level isn't as high as it is as it was maybe a year ago. But I do yeah. think there's still enough positive momentum, especially from the consumer sector, as you pointed out, that we're going to not see a recession. But I think the more relevant question is to understand that there are a lot of secular and structural forces at work, which would basically create an environment for a, an extended period of slower than ideal growth of very difficult policy issues and mm -hmm. quite frankly a lot of volatility and in that environment I think it's going to be a slow sideways grind for a lot longer than people might think. I, I guess one of those policy issues uh, it's always uh, front of mind is, is the trade war with China. Sure. As you assess the current state of play do you think there is a genuine incentive enough of an incentive on both sides to get to a deal phase one deal sure. fairly soon? Well I'm not in the prediction business anymore of whether we have phase one or, or, or not uh, hopefully we will have a phase one deal. Um, but I think if you take a step back, um, we're in a period of time where two very large economies and ecosystems are trying to figure out the right way to actually relate to each other. Hmm. And I think we're in a period of time where constructive engagement is going to be needed, maybe even on a multilateral basis, to find fair standards that work for international, on an international standards basis, where we have healthy competition where we have free flow of capital and smart regulation so that these ecosystems can learn to coexist and mutually prosper. Mm -hmm. I think to get to that is going to take a lot longer than people think. So I'm, I'm very hopeful. I'm not predicting. I'm hopeful that there will be a phase one deal because certainly you need phase one to get to phase two, phase mm -hmm. three. But there are lots of structural issues uh, at work here. And I think we should all be prepared that for a long period of time, there are going to be a lot of bumps in the road as these two ecosystems learn how to uh, 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 coexist with each other. Let's talk uh, more specifically about Carlisle. And you've been co-CEO for a couple of years sure. uh, and made a number of changes. I, I wonder how difficult it has been to make changes when you've taken over from such infamous, successful founders sure. who are still sort of uh, involved in the business, if not uh, operationally in charge, you know, whether that's tidying up things like the credit business or broader change of strategies. Has it been hard to make changes? And what do you think the biggest change? Oh, sure. The f founders have built a great firm. But look, the industry is growing. C competition is tough. Uh, the world is changing. The investment environment is as, as challenging as it's ever been. Transition happened two years ago. And we've been very focused on our priorities. We're driving earnings, trying to improve margins. We've got some really important initiatives going on in certain segments like global credit, which is our fastest growing segment. We've selectively used our balance sheet to make important strategic investments, for instance, a foray into extending our asset management capa uh, capabilities into insurance. And finally, we've wrapped that all up with um, uh, uh, changes in our corporate structure mm -hmm. where we're going to have the most transparent and the most aligned governance structure in the industry moving forward. Now, these are all uh, corporate initiatives, but I also have to point out culturally we have made huge strides in pushing diversity and inclusion. For instance, we're all already one of the leaders in diversity, mm -hmm. with almost half of our assets are managed by women. 50% of our new employees are, are, are women. And the essence of our business is to make great investment decisions. We're in the judgment business. Mm -hmm. We want to have the best diverse and the most experienced viewpoints around the table when we have to tackle these complicated issues and we are already leaders in the uh, in the industry on this respect but quite frankly we've got a lot more work to do what do you feel about uh, private market valuations sure. right now i mean we work we all talk about it a lot it, it was a, an extreme example but was it representative also of of other examples like that of, of uh, sure. a bubble in private market valuation sure. i mean it, it's hard to say that private market valuations aren't high uh, but i point out Valuations are high pretty much across all asset classes, mm -hmm. bonds, real estate, you name it. 
you know, when you have central bank policy that's been fairly accommodative and has much money in the world sloshing around, you're going to see asset valuation reflation like you've seen everywhere, and private markets are no exception to that. But when you have a business like ours, which is very diverse, all regions of the world, looking at all different industries, uh, the issue for us isn't to say, how can we buy something and uh, hope that the multiple or the valuation expands even more. For us, how we create value is to make the businesses better. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out ways to help them grow, improve their margins, drive real cash flow. And so I think we're in a world where I'm not betting on valuations coming down. I mean, you may see some dislocations and periods of time where valuations reset, but there's too much money in the world flowing back in. And so we have to prepare ourselves and invest with a view that you have to create value not by trying to make the valuation multiples higher, but by improving the businesses fundamentally so that they can earn a higher rate of return through just good old-fashioned blocking and tackling, uh, generating value in your business. Do, do you fear a, a price pressure coming into your business in the way that we've seen with active management, whether it's the broker price wars or, or shifts into, uh, into indexing? Well, our industry is not immune to obviously sophisticated customers trying to ask for certain types of fee or price, but we've been pretty, you know, we've been quite fortunate. Our, our funds have been more in demand than not. They've been oversubscribed. We have a, a terrific track record. And when you have all that, we've been able to maintain pricing. It's clearly an issue which is going to continue in the industry, but basically there are headwinds to our industry. Uh, it's a $6 trillion business. It continues mm -hmm. to grow. And when you have that kind of demand, uh, you know, I'm pretty hopeful that we'll be able to maintain pricing. I want to move on and talk uh, about Taylor Swift's battle with, with big machine records. Where, where does Carlisle Group stand on that? Uh, I mean, look, she's an incredibly talented performer and wonderful artist. Um, I, I'm not involved in the day-to-day -day of all of our portfolio companies, but uh, we have a talented, uh, a really strong team at Carlisle working with, in partnership with a great management team at the portfolio company level. And... I've got every confidence in the world that it's going to turn out to be a successful investment. If things elevate from, from where they stand, does Carlisle ultimately stand by uh, Scooter Braun and the legal terms of the investment that's been made? Or, or do you kind of understand some of the more emotional human arguments that, that also apply here? Well, look, in every business, there are risks. Every industry, there are risks. And when, you know, when you're in the investing business, you have all sorts of risks uh, for, from regulatory to financing, uh, and these risks are no different. They're peculiar or particular to this industry, but we're well experienced in terms of managing through and working with our management teams uh, to try to, to get to great outcomes. Um, uh, Senator Warren tweeted about this particular issue. She said Taylor Swift was one of many whose work had been threatened by a private equity firm. Do you, do you think that's itself an accurate statement, and do you think that private equity gets uh, an unfair framing of, of the work that it does by, by some politicians. Sure, without, without really addressing the tweet, um, I do think private equity is, is a misunderstood industry. I mean, we, we have an enormous value-added function uh, in the economy because of the returns we're providing to first responders, teachers, uh, folks in unions, and we provide the returns that enable these people grandmothers, grandfathers, to, to retire comfortably. And that's a little bit understood, but what's really not understood is the role we play at our companies. We help businesses become better. We build better businesses. And everything we do is to invest for impact. So it's not only about looking for financial returns, but we're in there helping improve ESG policies, create and drive diversity at our, uh, not only at the boards of these companies, but within the companies themselves. It's figuring out how can we invest more in R&D, capital expenditures, to drive growth and, and thereby create jobs. So there's a whole aspect to our industry that's not as well understood, but it's, it's, it's pretty darn value added. And uh, uh, I think that story is, is probably something that needs to be better communicated. Uh, you mentioned your returns over the long term and, and, and how impressive they've been. And we talked about the change in the corporate structure. The change in the corporate structure for some of your rivals has led to an incredible appreciation sure. in, in the share price. Yours is to come. I, I wonder, to finish on this cue, whether you think investing in the next Carlisle private equity fund right. 
or buying the stock is a better investment? <laughs> Both. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, our stock's had a great run. It, it's up 80, 90 percent this year, and uh, in large part because of all the initiatives we've been putting in place for the past two years, but also the governance and the changes in the corporate structure certainly help. A lot more work to do, and, and hopefully uh, we've got a great team at Carlisle. Uh, will be successful in, in driving on both fronts. So put a dollar in each and, and you're covered. I, bye -bye. I hope so.